Perfect. All right. So, okay, it's working okay. So we're going to be looking at um, African fashion manufacturing, okay, and in a, a, as a way to source um, and looking at ways that you can source your supplier. And I'll explain a bit more about who I am and what I do. But what I really want you to get out of this is to open up your minds to the great opportunity and the fact that the world is moving towards Africa in general, and that if you can tap into the region for your fashion production um, and capitalize on that, in the essence of your business is focused on that, then I think you're going to be in a good position because you'll be one of the first adopters effectively. Okay, so let's, let's dive in. So first of all, welcome to my lecture on manufacturing fashion in Africa. I just want to make sure that you know you're in the right place, um, your fashion business um, that's made in Africa, or maybe you're struggling with how to grow that business or even how to get started. Uh, maybe you're sick and tired of working with what I call the one one tailor by the roadside um, and you're ready for an easier to find a way that is easy to find your suppliers in Africa. If that's you, then you're in the right place. Before we start, though, do please make sure to turn off any phones. I'm terrible. I always have mine right by me. Now you can't really see with the background, but I always have mine right by me. And I have to just make sure I get it muted because you know, messages come through and it can be distracting. So please just try to remove any distractions. Okay. If there's any issues with sound or image, please do... Um, in the comment box so that we just know if there's anything going on as well and team do let me know as well so again welcome um there i am and on the on the laptop you can see in front of you is a screenshot of the website that i'll be sharing with you later what you can where you can get more access and our b2b service as well that you may be um, interested in so first of all who am i who is jacqueline shaw i don't assume that everybody knows me um, well, I've got a background in apparel design. I've worked for brands like um, Puma, um, Fila, Russell Athletic, um, C&A, which is a European retailer. Um, um, some other brands that you may not know because um, literally they are suppliers. So I've lived and worked in Turkey, in China and in Germany, working for brands and retailer suppliers in the fashion industry for nearly 20 years. And my company, the actual umbrella company is called Africa Fashion Guide. And um, that's what I founded back in 2009, 10, where I was building it. I do fashion consulting, public speaking, visiting lecturing. I'm author of the first um, coffee table book on the topic of African fashion. And this was 10 years ago. And it's actually, we're doing a 10 year anniversary um, version of the book coming out this year. So I'm really excited about that and um, so many other things I've done um, but my story started with redundancies um, you know, in the US they call it getting laid off I the various jobs I had in fashion I became jobless the companies closed down or they reduced in size some said you know I was told that I'm overqualified when I went for jobs some just didn't want me for different reasons some I just made me feel rejected and unwanted and so this was my story, working in the industry, yeah, I faced all of this. And um, I recognized that with Africa, there was an opportunity there. Generally, I loved Africa because I just loved the textile. That's what drew me to the continent. This British girl, like I mentioned, from Jamaican heritage, was drew, drawn to the African continent because of my love for the textiles. And I remember when I started researching, there was a quote from the World Economic Forum who said that Africa was on the brink of a major transformation. Outlook, the region was bright and, and um, at the time that the rest of the world was facing major political economic challenges. This was back in 2009, I believe. And if we look today, this is a similar story. We're starting to see more eyes on the continent. We're starting to see more people are being drawn to it through music, through um, tourism, through agriculture, because food, Africa is within literally food the world with this landscape, okay? Um, through things even like, um, um board sports <laughs> that's become a big thing because you know africa has you know, quite a lot of um uh what do you want to call beaches and opportunities for people to do things like board sports so 
some unusual ways and some popular ways and typical ways you think you may think even like the tech industry facebook twitter you know I remember hearing how they all wanted to jump into africa during their set up offices before the pandemic started so are their eyes on africa and if they're thinking let's get into africa it shows that something is happening on the continent so you're in the right place you know, by being based there or doing business there so when I started, I saw designers like Vivian Westwood in the top middle, Burberry, um, Mark Jacob, uh, uh, Junya Watanabe, all doing these designs which were using the typical wax trim. And um, they had an interest in the continent. Um, they were using the prints and that was their way of celebrating or being inspired by Africa. And, Again, when I started my research, I remember the Economist magazine, it was talking about over the 10 years to 2010, 10 of the fastest growing economies were in Africa. And they had annual growth of 8%. From then, of course, the numbers have changed, but it shows that there was, from an economical point of view, an interest for business and industry to look at Africa. So I'm trying to lay the foundation for you about the importance of the geographical location that you want to do business in. So here's my company, just to explain this now, as you see Africa Fashion Guy, I've got a new logo now that you'll see, um, but you may recognize the pink and black logo that has since the last 10 years. And these are all the elements. We do annual conference, um, in, has been done in the UK, in, um, in African countries as well, in the USA, in New York, we did something as well. So um, we do conferences and we have great speakers. We got the book, we can see I'm a um, pioneer in the book, and we've got loads of other elements like our membership clubs, horse and trips, etc. So you can see the company is quite in depth with this offering, and it's there to fulfill the needs of those who we, who we connect with. Um, and then here's a list of all the places I've spoken at, or some of the places I've spoken at. My first event was the House of Lords in the UK, which, if you know, you in UK Parliament, it was quite intimidating. <laughs> But since then, I've done amazing places. You, know, um, you can read there, I won't go into all of it. And um, some of the places I've been featured, um, like BBC, News, um, um, Women's Hour, Radio, um, and then even Vogue, um, Drapers, um, WWD, so many places I've been featured in now for my work in Africa, and um, my company for Africa Fashion Guide. Um, the annual conferences we did, you can see the speakers like Rosario Dawson we had there, and one of our um, you know, great speakers we had in 2015, the year, well, yeah, 2015, she came and spoke on the panel. Um, you can see that I, I was moderating at the UK Africa Investment Summit in 2020, um, and the two people you see there, one was from Unilever, the gentleman from Unilever in management position, and the lady next to me, is from CDC, who we all know now because of the pandemic. But at the time, they were just talking about, I was moderating that panel, which was all about manufacturing in Africa. So I do work with governments as well. I do work with British Council that was with the Enterprise Africa Summit in Ghana, with the Ghana government as well. So, you know, I've been asked to do things like this. I work with fashion schools. I have a prestige network of people like the folklore as well, amazing um, people as well who I'm connected with. And um, I have bought, my, the thing I'm most proud of is my campaigns for my t-shirts, which these are African cotton t-shirts, Africa, made in Africa, organic, fair trade. And I bought them to the catwalks of Ghana Fashion Week, um, Africa Fashion Week, Los Angeles, and the London Fashion Week as well. So, you know, it was all about campaigning for the African cotton farmers and the lack of subsidies that they receive or don't receive. Um, in comparison to the, you know, um, to others in the industry. So I campaigned about that. But it all started with an idea. It started, I had a vision for what I wanted to see to change the perception of Africa's textile industry. I had a love for the continent. I loved the textiles. And when I started to travel to various countries, I've been to about, about 15 now, multiple times um, over the last 10 years. And I meet with manufacturers, suppliers, and I feel more and more and fall more and more in love with the continent and its diversity in so many ways. Um, and I even did my own fashion label. So this was more like a streetwear label. As a, as a designer, I did sport and street and swimwear um, design. And when I did my own collection, I wanted to do something that was tapping into African um, sourcing, manufacturing. So I did organic cotton, jersey, 
and um, there's some recycled pieces so those green and orange pieces are actually parachutes that were made into jackets and dresses you can see the batik and the tie and dye um, which was done in Ghana and the organic cotton pieces were done in um, Kenya and there's those skirts were made from hemp so I brought those in so I've tested out the process of working with textiles you know, grown in Africa um, textiles that were um, fabricated, you could say, or manipulated by the batik that was made in Africa, and then bringing textiles in to be manufactured in the continent. So I worked in all different ways myself to test out the process, validate it, and obviously I sold these products. It was my label, um, which I started back in 2009. I don't do that anymore, but I used it to test the process. Um, so if you take anything away from today's session, I want you to know that you can grow a business and have quality suppliers and you can make samples that are quality that can obviously lead you to sales. You can do this, it is possible in Africa, but you have to understand the marketplace um, that you're working in um, for the textile industry. It's very different to that in Europe. So um, if anybody can, I like this to be interactive. I don't like to just be looking at myself, hearing myself and not just getting some level of um, response back to me. So I'm gonna put this question out. What are the main challenges that you face when you wanted to manufacture or source in Africa? Just write in the comments. Um, and I'm only looking for a couple of people just to respond back to me and let me know that you're here and what your thoughts are. What are the challenges that you may have faced? Don't be shy now. We're all here together. So do put a comment down there and you can see what people are thinking. What's the challenges you've been facing? What's the challenges you've been facing manufacturing in Africa? Um, we have one question. It's, I guess, specialized. Uh, what does it say? Specialized vendors for, I guess, like different textiles and things like that. Mm. Yep. Yeah. That's another thing people do want to find. Um, yeah, specialized textiles and so forth. Like example, I know people do come to me saying I'm looking for, they want to do sustainable fashion. They're looking for Lyocell or, you know, these Tencel or these kind of um, you know, modern contemporary eco textiles. And some of these things are just not going to be feasible on the African continent because of the nature of where they're produced and how they're manufactured and the opportunities on the continent. I'm going to show you what is available um an example i can see a few other questions um um sorry someone else also said finding bulk quantity is usually my issue uh, i wonder if it's finding the bulk quantity or the quantities that you are asking for because there are factories you can do bulk 500 three one thousand three thousand pieces minimum order quantity. So depending on what you have requested as well, blessing. So I see, I see your question there. But it's good, interesting to see that. Thank you for those who have communicated. Um, you know, it's appreciated. Um, but let's dive into this. We'll speak about some of those things as well. First of all, there's a few myths. There's a few myths when people think about an African fashion and they think that first of all, Africa can't make fashion which you know, I know is just stupid. <laughs> it can be done. Africa's been doing fashion or clothing making since the beginning of time, <laughs> yeah? And uh, yeah, so we've just put that one on the wayside. Some people think that you have to travel to Africa to meet suppliers. I mean, many of you may be based on the continent. There's some people who are not based there and they think that you have to go there first. A lot of the work I've done, I've done a lot of the groundwork through me and my team, traveling to the continent, meeting people so that you, don't have to. If you're based in Ghana and you want to be doing business with Sierra Leone, for example, which is not that far away, but you can't get there, or maybe let's say Ethiopia, then that's what my team has, myself and my team have done the groundwork so you don't have to go there. You don't always have to go there. There's ways of connecting without being there. But I do say on this point that at some point you do have to go to the country you want to work with. If, if you're a business owner, you need to know who you're working with. So at some point you definitely do and I recommend within the first 18 months, definitely make sure you travel. Um, some people think you need a fashion degree and years of experience to start. You don't. A lot of the big name designers don't have degrees 
you know, Vivian Westwood, for example, doesn't never had a degree, but she's, um, you know, one of the top UK designers. You didn't always have to do that. Yes, I have a degree. Yes, you know, but I don't do a fashion design business. I do fashion business. I teach fashion business because I understand that, and that's from doing the work, doing being in the industry. But you can still build a fashion business because you've got the creativity and you've got the, most of all business um, acumen, which is most important. Some people think that doing fashion in Africa is risky business. To be honest, doing fashion business is risky business, okay? And that's why you will find many banks do not like to fund or give um, money to fashion businesses because it's very risky, very, very risky. So that's something to take into consideration. It's not Africa, it's not Africa's thing, it's a fashion thing. And people think that money can't be made from African fashion. I mean, come on, of course it can, of course it can. You know, um, these days, right, I mean, look at the fact that, you know, Beyonce has been looking at, African fashion and she had the whole, you know, Black is King and the whole platform that she had. Um, the fact that the folklore exists is showing that, you know, there's an interest in having platforms which is showcasing African fashion because there's people who want to buy into it. You have designers who are working with IKEA, with Magnum, um, the ice cream brand, with um, so many kind of like international retailers, uh, Bloomingdale's, for example, Selfridges in the UK. You know, tapping into African fashion design and having designers showcasing and selling on their platform, their, in their retail shops or their platforms. Um, there's so many I could reel off. My head is just spinning with all the international brands who are tapping into African fashion. So that one is just nonsense, but that's what people think. Okay. So, but my thing is, if you want better suppliers, you want to do better samples, you want to get sales and have better systems. These are things that don't just happen on their own. You need to build these systems in and build your methodologies and you know, your business to be, able to, to be able to access these things. Okay, so one of the aspects of when it comes to suppliers and even for business savvy is having, is connecting with our platform, Fashion Africa Trade Expo. So Africa Fashion Guide is our, is our main business, but then our elements of our business is under the trademark Fashion Africa. So we have the Business Academy, the Sourcing Trips, the conferences, the membership club, and now the trade expo, all titled Fashion Africa, blah, blah, blah. So this is our new platform. And I'll show you a bit more about that. And it literally is about connecting African manufacturers with buyers. So that's where you can, as a, B, as a B2B platform, and we just like to say hashtag powered by Africa because that's the driving force. It's about the suppliers. It's all about connecting, building, giving, build, bringing trade to the African continent through the vehicle of fashion, okay? Um, and simplifying your sourcing, African sourcing. This is what it looks like inside as well when you have an account and you can register, you, you'll see the different suppliers and different types. If you're looking for garment makers or textile makers, footwear makers, you'll see different businesses inside there and then you can register um, requests, you know, to, to, to connect with them and then you'll be connected and, you see all the inside details about you know what they do and to make sure that it's relevant for you. You may want to select it through country or through um, production for the product that you're looking to source. That's just giving you like kind of insight. Now I'm going to show you um, in general from a textile perspective about fashion source in Africa. Because this is how where I think Africa can really own. Um, this element, this aspect of the fashion industry is through the textile. Africa is known for its textile. Now, people mainly think of kente. That's mainly what people think of. But look what I'm wearing. If you can see what I'm wearing, I know the background is a little bit messy, but you can see what I'm wearing. This is Togo. This is 100% cotton. Um, I believe this one's organic cotton. It was printed in batik, done in Togo. And they're one of our suppliers in the platform. And I just made this top from it. So it's kind of balloon sleeve, um, bell sleeve um, top because it's the style I want to do. But the textile itself is something that I think we can celebrate a bit more. So let's have a look. So to look at these four elements of the kind of crafts and textiles um, done in the African continent and what you could be certain, tapping into through the platform or just through your own research and then make that as an element of your own business. So. Hand printed textiles to start with, as mentioned, batik. We know that batik is a wax resist technique. Um, so it's using hot wax and stamps um, or, you know, to, to create your own designs. It makes it unique. It doesn't just have to be wax print. 
that everybody knows either kente or wax print they think that's africa africa is more than wax print africa is more than kente though we love both of those things there's so much more these textiles these batiks can make it original for you can make your brand stand out um so this is from one of our sourcing trips to ghana for a group of people and they were able to, to meet with batik makers and also to try out some of the batiks as well and make their own fabrics. The bottom right picture you can see where the fabrics that they made themselves. Um, and then you can see Rosario Dawson and Abrima um, area who do their brand um, Studio 189, which started off being majority about batiks and they still do that with some tie and dye, some indigo tex um, textiles and some woven textiles, but it's all about you know, African textiles and working with artisans. I just love what they do. I think it's amazing. Um, brand and how it's grown and just they're just amazing humble beautiful women um this designer is called makio for the nigerians in the house you will know amaka um uh, segue or segue her name is and her brand makio and she uses is a batik technique called adiru in nigeria and um her collections were sold in selfridges in the uk and i think it's beautiful she does it on silk she does it on Cotton, she does it on a variety of fabrics and just showing this textile and technique in a new way. She uses another fabric called Ashoke, which is the skirt you can see on the left. But we'll go into that a little bit later when we get into the woven fabrics. But this is one of the beautiful textiles. And I'm seeing so many Nigerian um, Adiwe batik tie and dye makers really showcase themselves now. And we have a lot of them on the platform and they're really developing these skills and selling it and i think it's amazing i'm really excited for that this one was done in um was a tie and dye done in the gambia so this was um sold to one of our customers in germany they have their own brand and um she's made um products based on yoga and wellness and these are some of the pieces that she made but she's using the fabrics that were sourced through africa fashion guide which was through our gambian um supplier partner um, so you can just see the difference in what you can get in different countries. And this is another Gambian um, uh, um, Zatika that I met on one of my first trips to the Gambia, I can't remember, about 10 years ago now. And that fabric I've still got today. I use it as head wraps and it's, it's, just, it's just lovely. I just like the fact that it looks like um, Afrocones, even though I've got no hair at the moment, but it looks like Afrocones. I think it's just really great. I mean, she doesn't look too happy, but trust me, <laughs> she was happy that I was buying from her in the end. But um, more textiles sorry the image isn't so great this was in the gambia as well um and then here's some other batiks you can see done in like the indigo coloration or with a mix of so it, the batiks can be done in you know two color way three four it gets more complicated but if you work with a good batika you can develop your own designs in beautiful colors and that kind of wax resist detail you can see on the right hand side that's its uniqueness which makes every piece different that's the greatness and the the secret of batik is that you're giving somebody something that is going to be uniquely different to anybody else who wears the same garment because the fabric is unique in itself. Um, there's a mixture of other batiks, one from Nigeria, bottom one from um, um, Togo, and the top right one from Tanzania. This is from um, um, Mali, one of our suppliers in Mali who does indigo printing for kind of like the month of Bogolan and just general just indigo fabrics you can do in Mali it also has cotton as well so it's one that's sourced locally um you can see beautiful um, um Lupita over there with her adire that she's wearing there um batik and they're just the kind of indigo colorations you can see here so you can go with that quite traditional um um indigo colors for the fabrics if it's a bogolan or if it's an adire I don't know if that's the Ileko one at the top then but yeah, there's just so many variations of the textile that you can tap into. And then there's, now I'm seeing a lot of, um, you're gonna get some Chinese makers who will tap into this, um, or India, they'll tap into the textiles and they will print typical African textiles like Bogolan that you can see here, but onto different fabric bases. So like the one on the right was done on a, like a satin, and also a chiffon. And the one on the left was a cotton, but it was machine printed. This was not hand printed. So I think that company's, I think that designer's called Giraffe, Midget Giraffe on the left-hand side, I think so. 
But you can just see how people are tapping into it and doing it in way, new ways. If that's the route you want to go down, you can work with um, the Indian or Asian and um, Chinese suppliers to get those similar textiles, or you can get it directly handmade in Africa. The choice is yours. So handwoven fabrics now. As I mentioned, the skill of the handwoven fabrics is something that people recognize kente, but then always remember that there's so many other textiles in Africa, and I'm going to show you some of these. This one here is kente. The kente is strip woven, so it's in little pieces and then it's stitched together, all the pieces. Um, but then some are done on wide looms, like in Uganda, like in um, uh, Nigeria, like in um, Kenya, um, um, Burkina Faso, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. But there's different types of looms to create different types of woven fabrics. And you have some which they're lying down flat, like the ones in Ethiopia are like quite lying down flat. Um, oh, sorry, in um, like um, you. Uganda is lying flat, Bikini is lying flat, and you'll have some like in um, Nigeria, like the Equete or the Ashoke, which is, they do it with the loom is standing. So the person is sitting in front and is standing. So there's different methods and different techniques. And there's so many compared to, you know, depending on different cultural groups in the, on the continent as well. So this was the Gambia, my friends in the Gambia who's making their woven textile, you can see that's also um, strips, but it's a smaller loom, um, but a little bit wider than the Kente ones. Um, there's another Kente one from our trips to Ghana, meeting the weavers. And you can see what I did myself. I used Kente and made a beautiful coat from it. Though you're not really supposed to cut Kente, um, so for the Ghanaians in the house, forgive me, um, but just showing that what there's options of things that you can do. Um, there is kente now that is machine woven. I know they're doing that in um, where's the country where Velisco is in Holland. They've been doing some machine woven kente, but it's not really kente then because kente means open clothes, or kente in the airway means open clothes. So it's actually a technique. Um, the, the name of it's named after the technique, but now you're finding that there's companies who have these big wide looms that they're doing fabric and they're calling it kente. You have to be very careful if you're sourcing kente to make sure that if you want kente that it's been strip is strip woven. You can see that it's been um, stitched together in the strips to make sure you're getting it authentic. Um, and then the one on the right was from a company called Madam Woki. Um, they and they were using country cloth in um, is that Madam Woki. I think they were, they're from Sierra Leone and um, I don't know if they were working um, in Ivory Coast at the time or with Sierra Leone, but they were doing their, so their fabric is also um, was done in strips, so it's been done in wider looms. And it's, you see the difference between the looks of these fabrics now. They're all hand woven, but they, they all look different, like that to these. There's a different look in the way that it's done. This um, is all the done in I have Ghana. a question, Jacqueline. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Is there a big price difference between like hand and machine? I'm sure it's probably a silly question and everyone on the call is like, <laughs> let me know this. <laughs> but I'm just, I mean, I'm curious. Some are going to, yeah, I mean, something like, sorry, like Kente that's got a lot of history and it's, you know, it's the association with it, it means that it's going to be a bit more costly. Um, like you usually have to buy them in their sets. So that could cost you 300 pounds, 500 pounds, depending on if you're getting the, the piece for the, um, the head wrap, the top and the bottom. Um, so we need three pieces. But if you're buying it from the weaving room yourself, you can work with them on how much yard did you want and you can negotiate with them. So I think that's a way of doing it. Like this designer, she bought hers from one of my previous students actually of our business academy. And my name was Madonna and she had a brand called Raffi at the time. This was back in 2013. Um, she was using um, the Batakari, which is from Northern Ghana, and um, you know, hand woven cloth. And the even the tops are made with that fabric as well as hand woven. So, um, but she was working with the weavers, so she would get it directly from them. I mean, if you're working, maybe if you got your textiles from Accra, maybe you're paying a bit more because it's the main town. But if you go to the source, you can then negotiate um, better prices. 
Um, but yeah, just looking at different fabrics, like I said, from woven cloth to hand printed cloth to natural fabrics like silks, etc., cotton leather, even wool. There's you know certain African countries are known for certain things, and so you have to kind of know what you want and then where to get it from. And that's where my expertise is and what I've been researching for the last 12 years. I've got books about it, I'm going to be launching more books about the topic and um, you know, inviting more people to tap into African opportunity and textiles. There you go, you can see the Ethiopian one. This is a company that makes um, fabric for Lem Lem um, by the um, designer and supermodel Leah Kebedi. Um, so um, we went to visit um, the manufacturing unit there. Um, another Ethiopian um, weaver. And this is the Lem Lem for the excuse the picture. Um, but you can just see the difference in how that fabric, the Shema, they call it, is translated. It's very it's softer compared to like you know, these fabrics, which are a bit more th thicker in the yarn. The ones in Ethiopia are a bit softer, they have been more can have a bit more drape, and you know, Lem Lem is known for you know create, sorry, creating what they call um cruise wear or um, kind of like quite beachy but it's very light and it's very soft and it's full and it's straight so what you're looking for would, de would determine or what your designer would determine what what you're looking for and where you're going to get it okay so that's something to take into consideration um this is some some other shema that's shown a bit closer up or the traditional ones for the traditional dress in Ethiopia the designer Matthew Mathi he's just he's amazing um, again, excuse the picture. This one is from um, Tunde. Um, the brand's called Et Ethnics in, in, um, by Tunde um, in Nigeria, and he uses Ashoke and with some leather, and they make bags and shoes. So, translating the textile into not just clothing, but accessory products, which I think is, you know, there's so much options of what you can do with African textiles. Um, and here again to show you like the the ashoke um, and how it's done on the, the the standing loom the textile on the right you have to forgive me from the group that well, i even bought this is why i even bought myself i couldn't pronounce the name of the group um, that i bought it from but it's from nigeria it's from a, a another cultural group it's not your typical yoruba or hausa or um, Ibo. It's, it's a different group and it's not often recognized, but the fabric was so royal, so rich, so beautiful. I had to purchase it and I got it in a few colorways. And you can get this as well. If you want something like this, you can reach out. The fabric on the round talking about. If you want to do maybe homeware, it's a bit stiffer. If you want to do homeware products or do shoes and bags, it's perfect. And it's hand woven. And it's a small um, village um, who do that. And it's, that's part of their, you know, their income as well. So beautiful textiles can be done all over the continent. And this is an example of a designer called Enko who, who taps into her traditional textiles from her country, Nigeria. She did um, these astral dresses made in astral care and her products were seen in Buckingham Palace um, with a event they had with, um, through the British government and through the Royal House where they invited African creatives and people from the African um, business industry um, to come and showcase and to meet the royals and the celebration of African talent in the UK. And she was asked to showcase her designs. And I think they look amazing, the way they've been presented and just the way the actual kit in the royal house is awesome. So let's look now at natural source textiles. We'll move this slowly along. It's cotton. As I mentioned previously, I have a personal um, love for the African continent and one of the things that really does not annoy me but upset me in some ways is the cotton industry. I work a lot with cotton traders and cotton specialists um, and I did a lot of research on the cotton industry when I started my um, business Africa Fashion Guide and I started it with doing a master's in ethical fashion and that's from where I launched my business. But part of that I looked at the um, cotton um, supply chain. And I realized that 95% of the African cotton is exported um, and a lot of the value is lost. So it's exported in its raw form. So the form you can see right now is the cotton bowl. That's what it's called, the way it's picked. And then it gets separated in the ginnery and it goes through to the mill and, and it goes through the dyeing process as well. 
and then it gets woven into textile, into woven or knitted into a textile. But if it's stopped at the big first part of that journey by being exported to Turkey or to China or other parts of Asia or in throughout Europe, it's losing a lot of its value. And what I wanted to do, that's why I did those campaign teas, was to um, talk about this, about the fact that we need to do, have more processing units, more gineries, more mills, more production units on the African continent so that the supply chain, the value chain can be kept on the continent, which means the GDPs, the economies of African countries can be raised. So that's something I'm very personal, personally um, connected with and talk about all the time. I think it's really important. Now, this is just to show you the beginning of it. This is one of the natural textiles. Some, come, some of our suppliers will hand, will source these textiles and they will hand, they will spin it and prepare it and then hand weave it into fabrics. And I think that's a great way of them, them doing that as well and keeping um, it local. That's a hey. very, oh, sorry, Jacqueline. That's a Thank very you. interesting point you bring up just because um, we did a, like a brand survey like earlier in the year. Yeah. And some and speaking to a lot of the brands, I was even curious, like, hey, you're basic Africa, why aren't you sourcing and using production facilities, you know, within the continent? And it's mostly because of the pricing and the costing. It is so much more expensive to source locally. So just knowing that fact that you even just said about cotton and most of it is <laughs> you know, exported from Africa, why do you think the price is you know why it's only is it a so few expensive? Gins and metals. Yeah, sorry. Oh no, yeah, I was sorry. wondering like why why would you say it's more expensive? But what's the I guess for me it's more so even too trying to understand the value. I understand the value from a very economical, you know, perspective, specifically for mm. Africa. But if I am a brand and I'm trying to, hey, get my cost, you know, low, keep up with my margins, what are some it's most it's more expensive because the cotton is picked. And then 95, 97% is exported to other countries where they process it. And then you're buying back the fabric. <laughs> so that means what could have been done just on the continent has been their processes broken up. They think in the USA, uh, the USA has a lot of cotton farming. I mean, you know, there's a lot of cotton farming in the US. It's processed there. And, and the USA, are very um, their cotton industry is very um, focused on owning that and their whole process so that they can um, subsidize their farmers because they're keeping it all local. Whereas African ones are encouraged to sell it externally so that they can make the money, but then they're not receiving the subsidies of processing everything on the, on the same continent. So they will have to now buy back this fabric so that it can be batik printed locally where it could have just all been done in one place and kept the value chain there. It's like you think, um, um orange juice you might be buying ribena or something like that or from pineapple juice and then the is coming from the fruit is is grown in let's just say nigeria then that is exported to wherever let's say the us where coca-cola is based wherever then the coca-cola will process it into a juice and then they sell it back to nigeria in the carton or the can and you're like even those countries just had their own just juice brand or whatever is called or welch's or whatever the the brand is they would or their own coca-cola they wouldn't need to be importing back where they really have to juice there it's crazy economics of it is crazy and it's mind-blowing sometimes it's just like, so frustrating but it's all about economies and and trade policies and the ways of trade and we can go deeply into that but we're going to just swiftly move on <laughs> before i go get you know uber passionate about it um but just to give them to give you all the foundation so you know 37,000 farms in eight countries um tanzania is the largest organic cotton producing country and they have um, production of it there but you've got like uganda which is also got, uganda's got one of the best quality cottons because it's long staple i'm getting complex with you now but the, the length of the cotton is long staple length which means that it's easy to process when they're um, um, yeah, easy to process, we'll put it that way. Whereas if it's short staple, it's, it's, it doesn't catch so well, which means it's not a great, great quality. Somewhere like um, 
Egypt, you know, is really good quality cotton. That's people like the, you know, Egyptian cotton is seen as like, ooh, you know, something because of the staple and because of the quality of it. But the countries like the ones you mentioned here, Ethiopia, Senegal, Burkina, they all do cotton as well. Um, but other countries are trying to develop theirs, like Nigeria and Ghana, but it's, it's challenging. This was when we was in, um, uh, actually in a wax print house in, in Ghana, and they, uh, they had the whole process there as well. So we're taking the group on our trips, we're taking them through the process, we can see how it's going from the cotton, the weaving of it, and all the machines were going like crazy, and then through to the actual printing process, amazing trips and the, those who came went away with their minds just like really opened about what they can do locally on the continent and um, these are the t-shirts i was talking about organic cotton fair trade african cotton made in africa grown by african sewn by african and um, even the prints are eco dyed and these are the ones that are brought to the, the catwalk shows um as part of the um the campaign that i had and they one with the, cam the catwalks you can see. Um, so naturally sourced textiles we were talking about. Leather is another one. Africa is known for its leather um, production. Um, but interesting, one of my first clients was um, a company called Linea Pele. Linea Pele is a leather trade show in Milano in Italy. And they, um, I learned a lot by having them as my client because they taught me, like I went over and visited their the studios and what they do and learn to learn. They, I was working on their project with Africa for them. And they, you know, he told me about how a lot of the cost, the level that they work with, a lot of it is also in Africa. But when it's all, the, the complications of this whole industry is where it's finished. So there's a rule of or, origin, and then there's rules around um, where that garment or product is finished will kind of be like, where you can say it's made in. So something could be made in Italy, but it's using, um, leather from Cameroon or Ethiopia, which has a beautiful leather, beautiful leather in Ethiopia, so soft. Kenya as well has good leather. Um, so it can be quite complex, but this was for one of our trips to Kenya. I took a group there. Excuse me if you can hear the noise outside. They've got the window open. Let me know if it's distracting. I can go and close it. Um, but yeah, this was one of our trips. We met one of the leather makers. We do like purses and wallets and you can even work with them on your own bag design if you want to. Um, yes, there are things like quantities and things that have to be discussed with them and maybe a little bit more expensive to do the sampling because that's just because they're making it directly for you. But you can work with some of these Kenyan suppliers if you wanted to, to do some of your own leather bag making. Um, Ethiopia, where they make the beautiful shoes, quality shoe making, because of their leather skills. You see that it's been handmade there. And this is one of our um, friends, um, Enzi, who's one of the labels who do um, shoe making. And the Ethiopian um, 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 founders are based in Ethiopia. Um, the only challenge with shoes is that not all the parts can be done on the African continent. A lot of it is imported, excuse me, like maybe the rubber, very typically Brazilian rubber is coming from China and the base is the bottom. The base, the heels often are coming from China as well. That's the way of the industry. Sometimes you can do all and sometimes you have to, um, like t-shirts for example, and sometimes you have to import parts to complete your garment. But that's, that's how it works internationally anyway. So it's not a problem. It's just how it works. Um, there's NZ again. And this is Sawa, Sawa shoes from, I think they're, Parisian based and made in Cameroon, I believe, if I've got the right country. Um, Ethiopia as well. Sandstorm is one of the bag makers that we work with in Kenya, visiting there. This was their first production house, and then um, they have a new product. They, they've enlarged their space um, and then on our second trip, and they do bags as well. Um, so, more natural source textiles is wool. Um, I know when I speak to people based in Europe, they always say, oh, Africa does wool? Like, Africa has so many different climates, people forget. You know, there's mountains, there's sheep, there's different types of wool-bearing animals, you know. And um, so countries like Eswatini and, um, and obviously South Africa, through to, like, um, 
you know, northern Africa, where they've, they've mountains, atlas mountains, and things like this. People forget. But um, we work with some um, suppliers. Who... Jacqueline, we have mm -hmm. um, five minutes left. So I just wanted to see if there was any, like, Ooh. questions. Let me <laughs> I know it was through. going best. By oh, so gosh. Yeah, you... Oh, gosh. Let me rush yes. through. Yes. <laughs> more, more wool, more wool. We'll go through. Um, natural dyes and colors. Wait, but yeah, if I'm anyone has any questions, they can send it through the chat. Um, it will, yeah. I don't have any questions so far, but if anyone has any questions, just type it out in the chat and we can ask Jacqueline in the last five minutes of this session. <laughs> yeah, if you do, definitely get your questions in. <laughs> I'll literally run through the rest of this. I won't even bother to speak about it. I'll just run through. So designers who do, who's wool as their thing like uh, Laduma of Makosa, um, and handcraft skills like basket making, which is very, very popular. Sea sour, raffia, elephant grass used in bags, um, and it's all helping to bring more trade to the continent as well. Um, Axe, he does this as well with um, raffia, beautiful bags, as you can see here. And then even jewelry making, you know, the typical Maasai beads, um, and there's beads done in various countries in Africa. You could be doing jewelry, embroidering. One of our suppliers in Kenya does this as well. Um, and then obviously you've got your wax print, which is very typical, which you all know and familiar with. You know, there's, there's some print houses on the continent, but there's a lot of imported prints from China for you to be aware of when you're sourcing your wax prints. And there's some of our suppliers actually put in like um, um, embellishing the wax prints to give it a new, new, new life as well. So some of our suppliers here from Uganda, and um, Malawi, do textile, do garment making as well. Is the dress I make wearing there um, in wax prints, and some of our suppliers in Ghana as well. So when it comes to African manufacturing, we work with suppliers in Tanzania. Um, this is in Ghana. This was in um, Kenya. Um, again in Kenya, Ghana. Throughout the continent, Ethiopia, throughout the continent, we've got manufacturers um, that you may be wanting to work with who do small scale, medium scale, and large scale quantities. And we visited many of these pictures are from, well, these pictures are all from places I've visited myself personally and those in the team. I've taken people to meet with these makers. So um, this was in Nigeria, Kenya. You saw the shoe making as well, maybe something you want to get into, bag making, getting Uganda, another maker. Um, um, and even all over, basically all over. Guinea, this one was in Guinea, Guinea Chronicle as well. Um, so I won't go into all this, but basically, as I mentioned at the beginning of our, of our training, is that there is an opinion about Africa, but when we look at the opportunities there, there's a growing opportunity. People are looking at the continent. By 2050, a quarter of the world will be African. And um, by 20, 2100, about maybe 40 odd percent will be African. So the world is looking towards the African continent as solutions for answers, for labor. There's opportunity in the textile industry, it's growing now. You can tap into that. The proximity to of West Africa, in particular to Europe, there's a shorter lead time, which means that if you're selling into Europe, you can, and you're based in West Africa, you can share this that you are close to to in location, which means that it's quicker for brand um, retailers to get their products from you. Um, um, Jacqueline, sorry, we have one minute. It's gonna, it's gonna shut off. <laughs> so oh we actually did get a question from Celia Anna, and she asked, sorry for the noise in the background. She actually asked, wow, how can we get in contact with Jacqueline for sourcing help? <laughs> Well, I'm working with, I'm going to flip through this, I'm working with the folklore now um, mm. on a few offerings that we're going to have for those who are here. They can share you more by email with our sourcing platform, the Fashion Africa Trade Expo that I mentioned earlier. Um, and that is going to be your way of tapping into um, manufacturers and suppliers. Um, the platform is open and we'll be able to give you business um support as well so it will be a special offer with you if you want with the folklore and africa fashion class so do reach out to rochelle um Vashnavi, Vashnavi and, and amira about that and we'll be able to give you a special discounted offer to tap into our suppliers so um it's yeah, called the fashion <laughs> 
I was gonna Sorry, say that was a time. I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I was I like that was the perfect question to ask. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, um, Celia Anna. But this was so great, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for um, doing this presentation and um, getting us up to breast on you know like the production mm -hmm. in Africa and all of that. Um, we, we are going to reach out to you guys, as Jacqueline said. We're going to do a partnership with Jacqueline. So. I know two people actually asked that question and we're going to actually partner so we can help you guys and, and get sourcing and production back into Africa and, and help you with anything else you guys need. So I would send um, a follow-up email and we'll send out once we have everything lined out. And um, if you have any other questions, you can email them to me and I can ask Jacqueline directly. So thank Absolutely. you so much. Sorry, it feels like I'm rushing. Like, <laughs> so no, no. thank you for your time i really appreciate it and i look forward to hopefully working with many of you further um over the year Viva yeah africa absolutely yes, <laughs> yes. Absolutely. well bye everyone really thanks again for joining thank you take care bye, -bye.